So I'm going to talk about, uh, we've had a lot of presentations about data. Um, I'm going to do a presentation about data. Um, the dream, let's open our data, says Tim Berners-Lee, um, who invented the World Wide Web at various TED conferences. And many organizations are beginning to open up their data. We're seeing a lot of government public data become available. Some of it you, you just download in files. I'll give you an example. Some train company data. I went to this website at the weekend and it could download an awful lot of data sets. They've got a lot of stuff uh, available, mostly scheduling and train times. There's a warning on the website. Please note that this data is of a technical nature and you will require a good level of computer skills in order to load and process the data. Uh, and, and they're not joking. This data is completely something out of the 1970s. Um, perhaps the sort of data format you would expect people interested in trains would, would create. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a UK talk radio called Radio 4 where they were talking about uh, open data on the Today program recently. And the smug interviewer rather uh, cockily said to the, the respondent, um, surely making the, this cryptic data available to people is, is a very limited value. I mean, the average member of the public just doesn't want this stuff, okay? But it, it's true to say that most people don't understand how to consume this stuff, but there are people who do. And those people can, can write, uh, can consume this data, and they can create stuff so that instead of getting up really, really early and stressed and getting to the station and facing this wall of gloom on a Monday morning, we can actually get early warning from some mobile web app to tell us that we've got delays on the train and that we can go back to bed and, and have an hour, another hour's sleep. So this stuff is important, people. Let's, well, let's do it. Um, we've got all this data. Why don't we just open it up to the world? Supposing we've got all of the, the political obstacles uh, solved, no compliance or audit issues. We've covered all the legal stuff. It's just down to us as technologists to take this data and expose it to the world. So what kind of, when we go back to our data, do, what, what do we see? We then realize that our data is, is buried under many, many layers of, of technology, application, functionality, and stuff. And it's really hard to get this data exposed. A lot of the time, the data isn't even in the format that it, it, that it was when we put it into the database. And we invent all sorts of layers and justifications for why we, we do things. Um, we create these things for the application servers. And I'm not saying that there isn't a time and a place for application servers, but the time is when you don't model time and the place is when you're place-oriented. And uh, no closure talk would be complete without a, uh, a dictionary definition. So my dictionary definition is uh, an application server. I looked up application server in my dictionary and I, I read uh, an application server is a device that complex data with presentation. Uh, so that's a one horn shot for you. I don't want, as I, I've often been on the other side of this equation, and, and I don't want my data complected with presentation. There's an awful lot of data in organizations which, as a programmer, I want access to, but this is my interface to it, and I can't actually get this data. Some of these websites and interfaces have been created by bringing together all sorts of wonderful data sets, but then it stops, and there's just this termination where all that's left is human beings chained to their desks with their mice manually pulling out this data and, and, and sort of imprisoned in, this, in these business processes which force them uh, to go about their daily lives under these mundane work, uh, um, websites. And, and as programmers, we shouldn't deliver this kind of interface to people. As a uh, songwriter, Robin Gibb died earlier this week um, uh, of the Bee Gees, and uh, he wrote, wrote a song called Islands, uh, Islands in the Stream. Uh, you know the one, Islands in the Stream, that is what we are, no? I was gonna sing it to you, actually, I've got a bit of a cold, so you don't have to. <laughs> but the, 
the, I, I, I was listening on, on the radio and I thought, yeah, actually, Robin, you're right. That's true. Our, our systems are actually just islands in the stream. You know, they're, we, they're islands in a data stream. And, and the data comes in and it gets joined and filtered. And we're just one point where we can actually, if we can publish our data, the next island in the stream can then do something maybe useful with the data that we never ever thought of. And this is a serendipity that you can get if you expose just the raw data. So, so I think with Clojure, we have an opportunity to start over, not just in the functionality that we write, but with our conception of data. So I'd like to uh, present to you a much simpler stack called a data server, where we have our data at the, at the bottom. In order to create REST services, we do have to do a little bit of resource modeling. Sometimes our data is in shapes which are maybe too finely grained. In, maybe they're in rectangular shapes in the database, where we do have to actually bring it together and make it a bit coarser to present it. We also need to do a little bit of uh, resource modeling because we may not so save our data. Uh, we, we may not be uh, responding to, to the REST model of create, update, and delete. We may actually not be updating database records, but we may be doing things like event sourcing. Uh, so closure and REST. Um, why closure and REST? I think between closure and REST, there is actually quite a lot of shared values. The four that I can think of is that data is, is once again paramount. Immutability scales. Identity is separate from state. And we tend to prefer general interfaces over private or specific contracts. Um, so what should a REST library provide? Um, more than this, but um, I think what's important is status determination. If any of you have ever programmed with Java servlets or JSP, you'll know that once you get this, this HTTP request object, you've got to do everything to create the response. And you've got to work out, I've got to set status 406, and I've got to set this header, and I've got to, and you probably don't bother, and very few people do. And it's very rare to see well-written REST services in organizations and even out there. And it's a hard thing to do. So a REST library really needs to step up and give that value to you. It needs to do status code determination. It needs to do content negotiation well. And thirdly, cache negotiation. And why can't you just do this in, in ring middleware? Um, and it just turns out that HTTP is uh, non-linear. I don't know if I can zoom in on here. But, um, you can see this is a, an activity flow diagram that was used um, by Alan Bean when he wrote Web Machine in Erlang. It's subsequently been copied by a number of, of frameworks. But as you can see, if you look in the middle, the, the flow is actually quite nonlinear, and it gets quite difficult um, to just write web services as, as ring middleware. Uh, we have tried, but it's just very difficult to get um, past the, you know, the 80%. All right, so it was almost a... <laughs> Okay, so closure REST library options. I had a, a stab at writing a REST library called Plugboard, which I've kind of abandoned now. Um, I had some difficulty with, um, I, I kind of overgeneralized the, the flow machine and it made the stack tra traces very, very difficult. And I, and I found that I, I, had, I kind of had the wrong model of composition. I, I've discovered uh, since then, um, uh, there's, there's a guy, uh, uh, Chris, I forget his second name, who's, who's been blogging about a, a, a library called Bishop. Um, there's, a, there's another library from Bank Simple called Close Line. They pretty much do everything that I've said that a REST library does. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Composure REST uh, from now on. I'm going to invite um, uh, Philip Meyer, who's the, the author of uh, uh, Composure REST, uh, to come up and just, we're going to explain some of the things that it does. Uh, so you can uh, get an idea of why you would use it and, and what you have to do. So Billy, do you want to, to come up to the stage? Yeah, do you want to? Yeah, okay. We'll, we'll have a and a and then... Uh, so I'm going to try and answer some of your questions, uh, but we'll pause pretty quickly for some from Q&A when I, when I show you what it does. So Composure REST, um, it just does the, the, the status determination and the content negotiation that I've been talking about. It steers clear of... Um, routing. 
So it isn't a routing library, and you can combine it with Composure, or you can combine it with Mustache or, or your own routing library. Um, but interestingly, um, if you wanted to write your own uh, REST library, it's a big job. These are the kind of these are this is the set of overrides that you have in Composure REST. Um, and explain how to use it, but just gives you a sense of how much functionality there is um, in Billy's library. Um, so essentially what you do with um, here, let me let me get you an example. Yeah, this is quite a good one. If I can just get the code up. Can everybody read that? The back? Okay, okay. So what we're doing here is we've, we've taken a, uh, this is a simple hello world example. Um, we're taking, uh, we, we just define a resource with def resource and give it a name. And then we give it a number of overrides. Some of these overrides, if they end in a question mark, are, are decisions. They correspond to the, the diamonds in the activity diagram. Some of them, if they begin with the word handle, are handlers. There's, there's 20 odd handlers, and each handler uh, corresponds to one of the status codes when you've finished determining the status in HTTP. There's also um, uh, actions which end in uh, an exclamation mark, and those are where uh, the library asks you to do something which is side affecting. That might be creating a resource, updating one, <coughs> deleting it. And then there's some information declarations that we have as well. So there's four different types. Uh, they correspond to the, the four colors here. Okay. In this case, we've, we've decided to um, override two of those things. So the handle OK is the normal status 200. We're going to get called when HTTP, the, the, the HTTP request hands over to us, and we get given a context. And this context contains five things. It's the, the status code, the status message, which is could print out if we wanted to. Uh, the third is the, the original request, which would be the ring request. Uh, the fourth one is the, the resource map itself. And we're seeing a resource map, so you can see what other overrides you share in the same resource. And the fifth one is the representation. Uh, the representation is a, is a negotiated representation, um, which means it tells you the MIME type you're meant to deliver on, the, um, the language, the encoding, and the char set. So in this case, I've told Composure REST that I'm going, to, I've, I'm going to provide English and Bulgarian as languages. The content negotiation has been done for me. I get given the context, and the, um, uh, I, I pull out the language, and I say, if it's Bulgarian, and I'm going to say, hello, George, in Bulgarian. And, and this, this works. You can, uh, unfortunately, I can't show you this in the demo. So that's a kind of an exercise when you get home to, to download this and, and do this demo, and you'll see that it works in a browser. The, the reason why we're using a, a single argument here, context, we, we are still in a kind of discussions about whether this is the right thing to do. We know kind of there, there, is, um, there are people who, who don't like a single parameter. The main reason is, is because we have all of these overrides available, it's quite confusing if you have to know for each override which parameters, which, which kind of function signature you have to obey. So we've, we've tried to make it simple, or I, or I have, but um, we, we're still open on this question. Um, OK, so we, we're going to come to um, uh, that's something else. I'm just going to find some water. So I, I downloaded, um, there's, a, there's a running tournament later this year in, in London. Um, we, I downloaded some data for the Olympic Games, and it's some type of separated data. This is one of the, the open data sets I got from Freebase, and it was tab separated. Um, so what I've done with this data is I put it through a reader and a line seek, 
Um, I split it by tabs. Um, and then I get the first row, which happens to be the header, and I use zip map to create a lazy sequence of maps. So that's, you know, we've all got maps. I mean, it, uh, that, these maps could have come from a data set. They could have come from uh, one of uh, Bruce's encounters, or, or could have come from Riemann. It could have come from a data log query. You know, I mean, we, we, we have all of this data. If we can get it into any of the data shapes in enclosure sets, lists, uh, vectors, and maps, um, then we get a lot for free from this library. And this is really what's quite different from, from other REST libraries. But we can just return this in our handle OK. Um, and if you were to connect a browser and, or connect a, a Composer root or a moustache root to this and then expose it um, through, through Jetty or a web server, you can hook up a browser to this and you'd get it in HTML. Then you'd, you could hook up uh, a text terminal and you could do curl and then you'd get the the response in, in plain text, which you could grep for. You could then set the accept header to uh, just ask for CSV, and you would get CSV or TSV. Um, if you want it in JSON, you get it in JSON. Uh, if you want it in, perhaps you just want to uh, connect a, uh, an IO reader to a URL and, and start reading Lisp structures, well, then you can set the, the, the accept to the mind type of application closure, and you just get um, closure form back. So you've kind of got automated, uh, automatic restful remoting of your closure data structures. So if you've got a map and you just want to expose it as a, as a fully compliant REST service, it's one line of code. And, and, I, and I really like this feature of the library. Um, so that's how you do that. Um, sometimes you want to say um, that you, pro you can provide HTML um, and you prefer to provide HTML, but if you have to, you'll provide XHTML. Um, and so you can put uh, weightings in the same way that you can do for, for user agents. You can put weightings on the server side and it allows you to do uh, server negotiation of content types. This means that you can make a declaration of what types you're willing to provide. If a user agent comes in and asks for a different type, you, it will automatically send a 406. You won't get called. It, it will all be handled for you, unless you choose to handle the 406, and then that's just another handler that you put in. But in any case, once you're hand, if, it, if they do ask for a content type, you know you just hit OK, and then you fish out the media type from the representation, and then you provide it. So in this example, I've said if the media type is either text HTML or XHTML, I'm going to return uh, a record. And otherwise, I'm just going to return the plain sequence of maps. Okay. Now this record um, I have here, it, it, this, is, this is quite a, 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 an old copy. It's actually the protocol that you have to support is um, just called representation now. So there's a protocol within, within Composer REST that, is already, that already supports all the base types. But if you want to do anything or you want to return something of your own structure, um, you can do it this way. And it's quite neat because you can decide to just uh, return something that is, looks like this does, looks like a, a, a view. Um, or you can return something which is another data structure, and that in turn through the, the, the protocol can, can turn into a view. So you, you can have a sort of model view controller pattern. Um, in this case, what I've done is uh, just compose an HTML document, which is a boilerplate document, and it just contains a, enough uh, for the document boilerplate to, to be rendered in the browser, and enough closure script to then go back to the same URL and pull out a different representation. In this case, it would be um, maybe JSON. And there's enough closure script to, to, to go back to the server, pull out the JSON, and then render the page. So it's a, it, it's a pattern for when you want to provide support for, for all your HTTP clients, but you also want to have quite a nice um, browser, uh, browser experience as well. You, you can do both in this way. And it sort of forces you to make sure that you're always providing your data in other shapes and not just HTML. OK. Um. 
would you use Compose your REST for uh, images and static content and closure scripts? Um, yes, you can. And um, this is what it looks like. I, I've created a, a, one of the things we found with closure script is some people are annoyed by the fact that you have this build cycle. You have to build it before you test it. So I wrote this uh, resource, which um, I, I could have written it in a number of different ways. But essentially what happens on this version is that when the first time the browser asks for the base.js, the first Google closure class, it then calls the closure scripts compiler and builds everything um, and then returns the, 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 um, returns the file. I, you can see at the end here that it's actually returning a vector. I need to explain what's going on there. Um, one second. Yeah, you, you can return three things um, in it, any of your handlers. Um, you can return a Boolean saying true or false, which influences where the decision tree goes. You can return a map, which implicitly means true, but it gets merged with the request. So sometimes you're in a step and you actually want to, you've actually determined some value and you want to associate that into the map so that other steps can fish it out. And that's what I did with uh, the, the JavaScript file path. And secondly, you want to say false, but you also want to give the map. So maps are tr just maps on their own are considered to be a true value. You can give a vector saying that the, the outcome is false, but here's some map to merge. Um, so that's what we've done here. Uh, and likewise, to do this for static content, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a similar block of code. Um, but what you get for free is, is the mime types, the, the e tags, the content negotiation, all the caching, the, you know, the data arithmetic. Also, you know, 176 pages of the HTTP spec is kind of there for you. And you just get it for free. And you get to choose where you need to tweak it. Um, so I, I really like the, the library. And um, I, I just want to, to go back to this slide about. Um, um, here we, are. The, the, we have a number of REST library options available for us today, but um, I think Michael Fogus um, put out a, a, an old paper, or blogged about an old paper called The Curse of Lisp, and I, I, where he said that Lisp is so powerful that what would take you know, some superhero developers like Jan Straustrop, you know, 10 years to do properly, to add objects to um, a, a, a non-object oriented language is something that is kind of an overnight homework assignment for, for LISP undergraduates. And that th th LISP is so powerful, uh, is the point in this article, that, that things cease to be technolog technology problems. But because things are so easy, you just get a lot of them, and they tend to be half-baked because the person doing it kind of loses interest and they go off and do something else. So, Problems about community are more, more about, this is a social problem more than a technical problem, that we, we do all have lots and lots of things, libraries in the closure world. Um, some of them maybe haven't been git tagged properly, some of them haven't been put to closures, some of them are just a little bit half-baked. Uh, and we tend not to have a lot of completer finishers in our community, uh, just perhaps. This is, this is maybe a, a question for the Q&A. Um, so what, I, what I'm trying to do is, is, is really kind of create a community around closure and rest, um, not, uh, not behind one particular library, but to really to pull our efforts across mailing lists and, and uh, to, to try and understand how we can best properly uh, implement this HTTP specification. Because there's not a lot of room for, for um, you know, subjective opinion in, in the way that the spec is written. Um, so we, we really think it would be, there'd be more value in once we want to keep the innovation in the community, we think there'd be more value if we have lots and lots of uh, people working on a really, really good REST stack, which would then just be a no-brainer for, for new people coming into the community who want to just take a map and expose it as a REST service. They can just do it with really good documentation and really good support. So I've reached out to, to a, a number of people who, who you, there's a lot of people who know a lot about REST more than I do. Um, he like Stefan Tilkoff with, uh, came back with some, a lot of feedback in our emails to him. And, and um, what I'd like to do is put all, that, all those questions and that feedback that we have curated onto the, onto the Closure REST 
mailing list. And, and if you're interested in really helping us um, complete the, the final 20% and, and the bits that we haven't quite covered correctly, um, it, it would be awesome if you could uh, help out as a, as a community effort. So I think uh, that's where I want to stop. And uh, oh, lastly, we, we, the Composure REST library does need a better name. I was out with Billy and, and uh, a few of the other Germans last night, and we promised ourselves that we would not stop drinking until we had come up with a better name. <laughs> the library has no dependency on Composure whatsoever. There's not even a, 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 a dependency on it. It's just a, it's a kind of a, a historical relic. So if you've got any suggestions for a good name, that, that would be welcome to. Well, rest easy. Um, great, let's, let's uh, join the mailing list and, and put it out there and we'll come up with a, a good name. That means any questions. Thanks.